Good afternoon and welcome to the analytical corner on monetary policy transmission, lags and heterogeneities presented by Julia Stefania. My name is Maria Lucia Guerra, I work at the Secretary's Department of the IMF and I will be your moderator today. Before we begin, just a couple of points to ensure that the session runs smoothly. First of all, please silence your cell phones and after that we will, I will invite Julia to come on stage. She will deliver about a 10 minute presentation and we will turn over to you for a 15-minute Q&A. Thank you. With that, let me invite Julia Stefania on stage. Thank you. As the curtain of COVID-19 restrictions lifted, we began to go back into our familiar routines. Work, dining out, even catching a movie. Life seemed to regain its familiar rhythm. But there was a catch. As we slipped back into our routines, we found that our everyday expenses, groceries, gas, meals out, even our morning coffees, were costing us more than before. Our post-lockdown world, it appeared, came with a higher price tag. This general increase in prices is the very definition of inflation. In 2022, as prices soared, central banks worldwide did something not seen in decades. They rapidly raised their interest rates in an exceptionally synchronized way and to high levels. But what is the impact of monetary policy and how long does it take for the effects to materialize? And what are the mechanisms and country characteristics that could influence this transmission? <coughs> My name is Julia Estefania Flores, and in today's session, we will answer some of these questions and try to understand whether they're more relevant than ever in our current global context. During the pandemic, governments stood at the forefront. They provided aid to cushion its financial impact on their citizens. When economies started to reopen, people were eager to buy goods and services again with the money they have saved during the lockdowns. But the structures making and delivering these goods weren't fully up to speed yet. Disruptions in the supply chain that help goods move around the world and rising commodity prices caused by Russia's war in Ukraine added further inflationary pressures. The result was higher prices as demand from people outpaced what could be supplied in our post-lockdown world. For the average advanced economy, inflation surged from an average of 1% before the pandemic to as high as 8%. While for the average emerging and developing economy, the increase was from 5% to 13%. So, what can policymakers do to bring inflation back down? Here, central banks have a key role to play, with monetary policy being their main and most powerful tool in the fight against inflation. Monetary policy allows central banks to control the price of money, or interest rates. When a central bank increases its interest rates, it's like applying a brake on the economy. This is what we call a monetary policy tightening. This makes borrowing more expensive, which tends to slow down demand and investment, helping to keep inflation in check. On the other side, when the economy needs a boost, central banks can lower interest rates to encourage more borrowing and spending. For the first time in decades, and in response to skyrocketing prices, central banks worldwide push on the brakes at the same time. As some inflationary pressures ease, 
food and energy prices receded, but core inflation, which is inflation measure excluding food and energy, remained high. Food and energy prices are usually very volatile and sensitive to environmental factors like weather or global events like supply chain issues or conflicts like the war in Ukraine. Core inflation is important because by excluding this, we get a better view of overall inflation trends. The stickiness of core inflation underlined the need for central banks to continue using their monetary policy tools for longer to curb escalating prices. In other words, to keep using the brake. In this context, the importance of understanding the timing and impact of monetary policy becomes essential. What are the short and medium term effects of monetary policy and what characteristics make it more effective? Most research in this area has focused on advanced economies due to data availability. Given the current synchronized global monetary policy tightening cycle, it is vital to analyze this with a broader sample. So we have expanded our research to include not only advanced, but also emerging and developing countries. This will offer a more comprehensive view of how monetary policies and country-specific heterogeneities operate across a wider range of nations, both advanced and emerging. In the next few minutes, I will try to unravel monetary policy transmission effects. A dance that shapes everything from the cost of your daily necessities to your long-term dreams, like buying a home. Imagine trying to figure out the source of a quiet sound in your car while driving down a busy road. That's much like assessing the timing and impact of monetary policy. Among a multitude of economic variables, it is our task to isolate the effects of changes in monetary policy, a complex job. When central banks increase or reduce interest rates, there are many other things going on in the economy at the same time. It is challenging to determine if economic indicators like GDP or inflation are responding to the rhythm of the central banks driving their foot on the gas or the brake, or if they're being influenced by other factors like or car running low on fuel or experiencing a technical issue. To do this, we've taken a page from the Taylor Rule playbook, sort of like a guide to fix a car. We've built a set of what we call exogenous monetary policy shocks. These are like sudden changes in a car speed that are only linked to the driver's actions. In the real world, this means we have isolated changes in countries' interest rates from changes in other relevant economic variables like GDP or inflation. We've put together these shocks for 33 advanced and emerging economies from 1990. Let's see what our findings tell us. Our first question is on timing and effectiveness. How long does monetary policy take to reduce inflation? And how much GDP will need to be sacrificed to get this reduction? Our research shows that for the average country in our sample, while the impact on GDP is almost immediate, the effects on inflation and core inflation take longer to manifest. After a tightening shock, GDP starts to decrease immediately, maintaining similar levels from the second quarter until its peak. For inflation and core inflation on the other side, it takes approximately five to six quarters for the effect to peak. So the good news is that monetary policy works. Inflation tends to come down when central banks raise interest rates. However, when central banks apply the brakes to control inflation, there is a sacrifice to be made. The sacrifice ratio, which is the amount of GDP given up to reduce inflation, initially creates a dip in our economic output. This result underscores the importance of central banks acting proactively. 
it is crucial to intervene sooner rather than later because the effects on reducing inflation take longer to come into play. Next, uh, we also look at different country-specific characteristics that might affect transmission. Our research finds that transmission is stronger when countries have floating exchange rates. This suggests that changes in exchange rates are a key mechanism through which monetary policy impacts economic activity and inflation. It could be explained by the following mechanism. As a central bank tightens, two key things happen. First, borrowing money gets more expensive, like your mortgage rates going up, but on the flip side, your saved money starts to earn you more interest. When one country's interest rates are higher than another's, money often flows to the better rates for higher returns. At the same time, this pushes up the value of this country's currency. Now, with a stronger currency, this country's exports get more expensive while imports rise due to cheaper foreign goods. This leads to fewer exports and more imports, thus slowing growth and further reducing price pressures. But this mechanism only works for those countries that allow the exchange rate to adjust freely to market conditions. Confidence also plays an important role in how central bank policies can control inflation. Let's say prices start to rise, and people see their paychecks aren't stretching as far. If they think this is going to last, in other words, if they expect inflation to stay high, they might ask their bosses for a raise. Now, if wages start to increase in an already inflationary environment, Demand can keep pushing up inflation, which can cause prices to rise even more. This is what we call a wage price spiral. When a central bank raises interest rates, part of its power to control prices comes from managing these inflation expectations. If a central bank is transparent and credible, it is better at clearly explaining its present and future decisions about monetary policy. This way, people and the markets understand better and trust that the bank is doing what it's needed to keep inflation in check, which, in turn, helps to keep inflation expectations under control. Accordingly, we find that central banks that are more transparent typically show a more effective transmission and therefore see a more significant reduction in inflation after a tightening. Finally, our research also shows that in countries with more developed financial markets, monetary policy is more effective in reducing inflation, and these effects tend to last for a longer period. This is likely because of a better functioning of the credit channel in these markets. When the central bank lowers interest rates, it's cheaper for banks to borrow money. As a result, banks can loan out more money to businesses and individuals, which can stimulate spending, boosting the economy. On the other hand, when the central bank raises interest rates, borrowing becomes more expensive and banks lend less, which can slow down economic activity and reduce inflation. Let's conclude. In the complex puzzle of economics, monetary policy stands as a powerful piece it not only dictates our spending and saving patterns, but it also shapes how we combat inflation. Our journey through the post-pandemic landscape and current sources of inflation has underscored one thing. The roadmap to a stable economic course needs a good understanding and effective use of monetary policy. To do this, we constructed a novel measure of monetary policy shocks across a wide range of advanced and emerging market economies spanning three decades. Our findings reveal that tightening monetary policy swiftly impacts economic activity, but the effects on inflation and core inflation require substantial time to fully materialize. Therefore, central banks need to act promptly and remain ahead of the curve. We also saw that these results mask significant heterogeneities that depend on country-specific characteristics. 
monetary policy tends to be more effective in areas with one, solid financial systems, two, dependable policy frameworks, and three, flexible exchange rates. In simple terms, our study suggests that structural reforms that can help improve financial systems alongside with the maintenance of central bank transparency and independence can help face inflationary pressures more effectively in the future. Just as a well-oiled engine and a skilled driver can keep a car on the right path, these measures can help us navigate through inflationary roads ahead. Thank you. Julia, for the um, captivating presentation, you have certainly given us a lot of food for thought. So let me turn now to the audience and open up for questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We will bring, we have a person, a colleague uh, with a microphone, um, and when you receive the microphone, please stand up, say your name and affiliation, um, and then try to keep your question brief. So let's see. Um, we have a question here, the gentleman and I. Ashok Bundia from Exodus Point. Are these exchange rate regimes you're measuring, are they de facto or what they tell you they have as a, a, a regime? Like um, a, a country may claim it's a float, floating exchange rate, but actually highly managed. So that's a question, uh, I'd like to comment on that because normally when exchange rates depreciate, so the other thing I, I want to really ask is, what are you measuring? Are you measuring the response of the exchange rate and then inflation? Or are you saying by hiking rates, exchange rates actually appreciate and help you to bring inflation down? Thank you for your question. So on how we measure exchange rates, we use a database from Itzeski, Reinhard, and Rogoff, and they have, uh, they classify countries on whether, with different uh, exchange rate systems. So we classify as fixed, those are have a peg or a clawing peg. Those are the, the ones that are in this group. And how we do this um, analysis, so we have, uh, we do an interaction, right? We create a dummy with the countries that are classified as fixed, and those that are, are classified as non-fixed. And um, we look at the differences on the impact of a monetary policy tightening in inflation and GDP, depending on whether the country is in one regime or the other one. Yeah, and we, I mean, what we think is that we explain the channel through the external channel. And what we think is that transmission is less effective in those countries that have fixed exchange rates because they don't have the, the, the external channels muted for these countries. Elijah Oliveros from S&P Global Ratings. Uh, thanks, Julia, uh, really interesting presentation. This may be out of the scope of your paper, but okay. did you look at um, whether the response is symmetrical? In other words, um, yeah. is the impact of lowering rates have similar lags than interest, increasing interest rates? Yeah, thank you for your question. So, I mean, this is a part of the research of a paper that will be published on October 18th along with the Asia Pacific Regional Economic Outlook. So the paper will include more stuff. Uh, we just put together whatever, um, a short part to, to show here. And yeah, we look at asymmetries. And we see that tightening is more effective than loosening, usually, yeah. The gentleman here up front, please. Thank you very much. Abdesamad Saidi from Bank Al Maghrib. I can't hear you. Um, I, I just want to know Abdesamad Saidi from Bank Al Maghrib. Uh, I have a similar question regarding asymmetry. Okay. Uh, uh, is there any non linearity issue in your uh, analysis? Uh, like if you increase 100 basis points, you sure, are you sure you're going to have um, uh, four times the effect of 25 basis points? This question of linearity, do you take that into consideration? So, I mean, how we do it is we just do the, um, the interaction and we look at the effect of, yeah, 100 basis points monetary policy shock. Um, we have uh, many other non-linearities 
that we looked in the paper, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I have a reply for you, but I can go back to you later. I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and if the audience is a little bit shy, perhaps I can ask you, Julia, or have you? Ah, no, there's someone. Please, the gentleman on the, in the fifth row. Hi, um, Bodhi Shonubari from uh, FBN Quest Capital. Uh, Can you speak a bit louder, please? Uh, okay, sure. Um, I guess my question is more around: um, Have you? Um, is there any sort of sort of cost-benefit analysis done on um, potential disadvantages of you know hiking? You know, especially in terms of I guess debt sustainability and um, you know if, you, if we, given that. DM in the developed markets, they they're going they you know they've continued to hike, and I don't think you know emerging markets can carry on hiking in that you know you know to sort of try to keep up with that without causing debt sustainability issues. So we don't look directly at debt. Uh, nevertheless, we look at fiscal. We look at how monetary policy and fiscal policy um, how they behave together. So we check this. When, so we look at when monetary, there's a tightening in monetary policy, if there is a tightening also in fiscal policy, fiscal policy is also tightening, we see that the effect on transmission is stronger. But that's the scope of the paper. We look at transmission to GDP and inflation, depending on certain things, and on fiscal, that's, uh, that's what we look, we look at. Thank you, Julia. I think uh, we are running out of time. So before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you, uh, actually give the final word to you and ask you to tell us um, for today, what is the one key takeaway that we should take with us today from your presentation? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, today we took a walk through the post-pandemic landscape and current sources of inflation and we saw the monetary policy is a very important tool to address it, right? If you have to remember one thing, I'm going to make it two. <laughs> one will be uh, timing is critical. If you want to address inflationary issues, it's better to act sooner rather than later. And the second one is that structural reforms can help countries to address inflationary pressures more effectively in the future. And I, well, I would like to thank everyone for coming here today, and I hope you enjoyed the session. Thanks. Much. I, think, I get uh, out. We enjoyed. Yes, no. please. I was just going to say. Well, thank oh, you okay, very okay. much, and in, and let you know that this is the last analytical corner for today. But we will have another one tomorrow at 10 a.m. For those of you interested, it will be in this same room on seven lesson facts from 100 inflation shocks. I hope you can join us then. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you.